Welcome everyone, I'm Dick Deming. I'm medical director of the Mercy One Cancer Center and founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our cancer education series. Um, this series is brought to you uh, in part by a grant from the Rosalie and Sherry Xline Ziegler Fund. And tonight you're in for a treat and so am I because I've got my friend, my colleague, Dr. Viet Lay with us tonight. So welcome. Thank you, Dr. Damon. It's uh, really a privilege and an honor to be here with you tonight. So Dr. Lay grew up in um, Atlanta area during elementary days and then uh, went to high school in Massachusetts, then off to college at the University of Georgia. He went to medical school at the Medical College of Georgia and did his residency in general surgery in Greensville, South Carolina, and then did a fellowship in surgical oncology at the City of Hope in Los Angeles. And we're gonna be talking tonight about surgical oncology. What is surgical oncology? How do you get to be a surgical oncologist? And what do you do after you're a surgical <laughs> oncologist? So, so welcome. So when did you uh, decide that medicine was in your, your future, that you wanted to be a doctor? Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the kind introductions. Um, I think as you can uh, see there, you know, my uh, training, pathway sort of started from the East Coast to the West Coast, and now I'm in the Midwest. So this is somewhat of a final frontier for me. <laughs> yeah, we're the middle coast. <laughs> the we, middle coast. Yes, we, we've got the Missouri River on one side, the Mississippi River on the other. So we got lots of coastal land. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that perspective. So did you always know you wanted to be a doctor? Yes. So, uh, well, so no. Um, growing up, uh, I have always wanted to either being some form of an engineer, uh, whether it's mechanical engineer or aeronautic engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to play with things and, and understanding the, uh, the, the physics behind mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until when I was in uh, college, that's when the, uh, the science classes started to overwhelm me. Okay, let me ask you, when you started college, mm -hmm. what was your very first declared major? Yes, so my major in college, believe it or not, was uh, biochemistry. Okay. And uh, the reason being because I felt like it's a combination of biology and chemistry. So you get the best of both mm -hmm. words. Um, and what was your claim to fame in high school? <laughs> my claim to fame in high school was that I had a very cool car. A cool car. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm seeing the surgeon coming out of you already, like to fix things, build things, know how things work. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. So what was your cool car? Um, yeah. So actually, I, I got a chance to um, to share this with uh, one of your partner, uh, Dr. Collatier, and uh, and he and I sort of got along right away when I was interviewing here, and. Um, so I'm a Japanese uh, car buff. I love everything that the in terms of Japanese mechanic, um, and 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 the fascinations with that is because um, if you look at Japanese mechanic, the engine size are not focusing on displacement or the, or the sheer size of the engine. Usually the the engines are you know on the smaller uh, uh, scale of uh, in terms of the size and the displacement. But, but but what the efficiency of how they able to utilize the size the, the, and the mechanic parts within that uh, confine of space and in turn producing the amount of power that it's able to produce that's also very gas friendly uh, uh, for the environment. That was something that, you know, really uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very okay, interested in. Okay, um, so you could probably change my oil on your days <laughs> off. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So we had your, your claim to fame, a cool car, and then in college, biochemistry, and then somewhere during college, you decided you wanted to be a doctor. Yes. Yes. And, and what was, how did that come about? Yeah. In my uh, second year of college, uh, that's when, you know, you start getting into a little bit more intense uh, classwork or, or college courses. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I started to ask myself, okay, so what, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Uh, and also being in that environment, I interact with a lot of students who, uh, or friends who are uh, pre-med. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and, you know, to me, I came to the realization that everything we learn in science 
kind of come together in term of life and 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 obviously the human body yeah take the most priority mm -hmm. uh, uh or in the center of that and so I, I became more and more interested in it and i had friends then start talking about you know preparing for the mcat and and, and studying yeah. for the the test to get in the test to get into yeah. medical school and yeah. so i say well i think uh why don't i, I test my luck on that and uh and and one thing led to another okay so then the next big decision in kind of medical education is you're in medical school and it's okay what do you want to go into what do you want to do your residency in and so there's kind of this general dichotomy of going the medicine route where you treat people with medications versus the surgical route where you fix them with surgical was that a pretty easy clear demarcation for you to go into the surgery fields yeah um uh, so not quite um you know i came from a background where we don't have any medical professions in the family uh, so i was a little bit in uncharted territory mm -hmm. um and i went into medical school with the intention of becoming a primary care physician because I love the human interactions and obviously the continuity of, of, of care that you're able to provide following a family, you know, from the grandparents to uh, the, 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 the young child. Uh, and, and, and so generational care was, was the aspect that I, I found very, um, uh, um, very, um, I, wanna, I wanna be a part of. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't until my third year of medical school where I started to get more exposures into uh, the procedural aspect of medicine. And I got I had the opportunity to rotate with a uh, general surgeon uh, in the community. Uh, uh, and to this very day, you know, he remained a, a tremendous mentor for me. Uh, and, and so I followed Dr. John Odom uh, uh, down in Savannah, South Carolina, uh, had many sleepless nights with him, <laughs> uh, but also get to see the You're being the, on call. You mean being on call, uh -huh. taking care of you know his uh -huh. patients, and and seeing the profound impact that he's able to make, not to only for his patients, but also to the community mm -hmm. in the area, um, and so that that sort of uh, set you know exemplified to me uh, how I felt would be the the. Uh, how I see myself as a physician, and then obviously the the mechanical interest side of, of my brain sort of took over, mm -hmm. and so it the combination of the two uh, is what led me to okay. going into. So surgery. we jump ahead, and you're doing your residency in general surgery, and at what point during your residency did you decide you wanted to go on and do a fellowship in cancer surgery, or what we call surgical oncology? Um, so in, in our general surgery training, um, we get to rotate through multiple subspecialty within surgery. And especially on the surgical oncology service, um, I noted that, you know, a lot of our patients, um, you get to develop a, a strong relationship with them. Uh, and, and when you talk to these patients, you really try to get an in-depth understanding of how, you know, how have they lived their life to the point of where they are there in front of you. And so it's that in-depth knowledge and understanding of the patients that I felt very intriguing. Mm -hmm. And also the, the, the ability or the, 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 the privilege of being able to provide that care to treat that disease for them um, and, and many success story uh, from that that I felt very humble to be a part of. And um, and then the, the 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 most humbling part of all of that is you know getting to see them on the other end of that journey, and 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 like many of our audience in here, you know, seeing you know your faces and what you have been through. Obviously, the story that you know behind that and what you had to go through is what very inspirational for me. And so it was my third year. Of, uh, and so the short answer to that question then uh, um, is that it was the third year of my uh, general surgery residency. And I could remember, frankly, um, going into uh, doing a lumpectomy for a uh, female patient with breast cancer. And, um, and, and after removing the lump of cancerous tissue 
and 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 holding it in 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 in, in my hand, and you know, I was really overwhelmed with emotion of how much of an impact that I was able to um, to 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 be a part of for for that you know that that patient life, and uh, and that's how things kind of transpire. Okay, and so give us a sense for the, the number of years. So obviously, twelve years through high school, four years of undergrad four years of medical school, five years of general surgery, yes. and then surgical oncology was another how many years? Yeah, so I was a bit of a non-traditional candidate okay. in my training. So after general surgery, um, I went and practiced general surgery oh. um, in the community. Uh, part uh, that the practice I was in was affiliated with the uh, the university uh, uh, program that trained me in in, in South, South Carolina, South Carolina, yep, in the upstate. But of South the Carolina. general residency was five years. The general surgery residency was and five so years. So then you practiced general surgery for how many years? For four years as four years. a uh, general surgeon in the community, mm -hmm. and part of my uh, practice then was you know um, a mix of you know general surgery, surgical care for the community. Mm -hmm. Um, and also being involved in a small cancer center that was part of that community. And, uh, and, and then I started to get more and more, you know, um, uh, inspired in that and also felt that, you know, uh, my knowledge base and skill set that I possessed at that time wasn't quite um, adept for me to take care of more advanced cases of cancer, uh, of cancer, yeah. you know, I'm, and I'm not, Talking of more the the, the straightforward, mm -hmm. but more of a, a, a complex advanced cases, and uh, the opportunity uh, to open up uh, for me to come out to Los Angeles, uh, and 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 being at uh, the City of Hope Cancer Center, and I spent one year there, um, gaining additional experience and training in more in surgical oncology or providing cancer care for uh, for patients, oftentimes with um, you know, fairly advanced, uh, okay. yeah. complicated mm -hmm. uh, cases, yeah. and and my training track was gearing more toward being uh, in the community, being a part of the community, and provide and de translate the knowledge of surgical oncology into the community and delivering that care out towards you know the community yeah. and, and clinical so, yeah. care. You must be like 82 years old because <laughs> we're talking about 12 years to get you through high school, four years of college, that's 16 years of, of study, four years of medical school, that's 20 years of study, five years of general surgery, that's 25 years of study, four years then general surgery, 29, and then another year, 30. So 30 years of uh, education before you got here to <laughs> us. Wow. But as you know, you know, medicine is a lifelong learning mm -hmm. process. So yeah. um, we all are students of that, I would say. So um, we're so happy to have you here in Des Moines. Tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what is it? What is a surgical oncologist? How does a patient find their way to a surgical oncologist? Yeah. Um, and, and I would paraphrase, you know, the, the definition for surgical oncology and surgical oncologists, as you know, evolve with time. Um, and, and I would paraphrase, you know, um, uh, the definition that was set by uh, our, uh, the, our society president, Dr. Douglas Taylor, uh, uh, Tyler, who is a giant in the field. And, you know, his, his comment has been that, you know, with the evolution of time, a surgical oncologist is defined as a surgeon who specializes in an area of cancer care that ha also possess the ability to speak the language of multidisciplinary care uh, in, in that setting and in that fashion. So uh, in, in, in short, it's a surgeons who are trained in, in the principle of cancer and able to work with other cancer specialists to provide the most optimal care for patients with cancers and obviously these depend on disease sites and disease specific. Yeah. There are very few patients that just have one cancer doctor. You know, the, the three general fields are surgery and radiation and chemo or medical oncology. And as you talked about multidisciplinary are those disciplines, plus you throw in 
the diagnostic radiologists and the uh, pathologists and the genetic counselors and, and all of the other ancillary folks. So um, also over the years, um, some of the cancer surgeons kind of have, are, have different trainings. So for example, our breast cancer surgeons, they're often not trained in some of the complex surgical oncology. They, they have fellowships that focus specifically on breast. Our colorectal cancer surgeons um, have been trained in general surgery and then focus on the colon. What would you say are the types of cancer that a surgical oncologist like yourself, with the training you have in, in the current setting, uh, what are the types of cancer that you take care of surgically? Yeah. Um, so within the realm of surgical oncology, we get to uh, experience a fairly diverse group of disease sites. Um, and for that, you know, we sort of lumped it into gastrointestinal oncology, uh, anything in the, the gastrointestinal tract. And, and that, that would, would include like, go, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, and, <laughs> and that could include, you know, anything from the esophagus uh, down to the rectum and, and, and the anus. Mm -hmm. um, so esophagus, stomach, stomach, pancreas, and then um, I would say bladder. small intestine, uh, colon, appendix, rectum, and anus. And then within that, you have, you know, the hepatopancreatic biliary system, and that would involve the liver, the bowel ducts, the gallbladder, mm -hmm. and the pancreas within mm -hmm. the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah. So those are the, the types of cancer that you often get called in on. And um, as you mentioned, a multidisciplinary, we have a multidisciplinary cancer conference that happens once a week that you and I are part of, where uh, cases are presented and surgeons, surgical oncologists are there, the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, the diagnostic radiologists, the pathologists, and as you mentioned, it's it's usually not just one doctor calling the shots, but how do you uh, treat the patient optimally with the various forms of treatment and what order do you do things? Right. You know, the, I would say the old fashioned order was the surgeon always went in first and then we considered maybe some chemotherapy radiation afterwards. But now there are many, many patients where uh, we might start off with chemotherapy first before surgery. Yeah, and I think what you said has uh, really been the change that we saw, we have seen um, in the last 30 years, you know. Um, and, and, and if you look at the evolution of, of cancer surgery um, uh, over times, and obviously, you know, we can start all the way back in, in the, the the era of antiquities, you know, how, how uh, uh, the ancient philosopher and the ancient surgeons have always uh, view cancer as, you know, an incurable disease, you know, meaning that, you know, once patients uh, came with cancer, it's usually a, a terminal event. Uh, because what they had found in the ancient time was that, you know, any treatment for cancers usually um, um, lead to non-curable type of treatments and the cancer would come back even before the patient heal. Um, but, you know, um, uh, in the last uh, couple centuries or so, we have, you know, the, the, the invention of anesthesia. We also have, you know, very brave and talented surgeons who went on to, you know, figured out that, you know, cancers spread by different um, uh, mode. Um, and so uh, how do we able to provide radical surgery to try to remove the cancer? And in addition, all the little pathway that the cancer could potentially spread. And one common, uh, you know, one very known, well-known example of that is uh, Dr. William Halstead uh, at, uh, in jo at Johns Hopkins, you know, and his, um, he was the pioneer of the radical mastectomy in, in, in women with breast cancer. And that's when you go in and you would remove the breast, you know, you would remove the, the muscle that's underneath the breast and that fascial layer, in addition to removing the lymphatic channel uh, all the way up to the, uh, the axilla or the armpit, and also all the lymph node within that area. And for a while, you know, that concept seemed like it did provide control of, uh, 
of cancers, but even so, you know, the morbidity, the uh, the the events that happen, and 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 all the side effects and side complications of, of, of that of, sort of, of surgery of those type of treatment, all those radical treatment, were just becoming too morbid. Um, and how do we um, not only uh, improve patient survival, but also improving their quality of life and 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 uh, while they undergo treatment was also, you know, another concept that came up. Uh, and so, as you, you know, may very well know, and this was really in, in your your area of, of, of treatment and expertise, and uh, is, you know, all the randomized trials that we have in the 70s with the, the NSABB uh, 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 studies that show that, you know, we, when we look at patients that did get those type of radical treatments to those who get a little bit less of a treatment, how do they fare and how do they look? And then we start combining that with radiation therapy into that. Then, you know, we actually found out that those patients do as well. And then maybe I would argue that there are some you know, area that they do even better in patients who receive multimodal treatment, mm -hmm. less surgery, but with addition of radiations, tend to do a, a little bit better, or if not the same as patients who had, you know, the radical treatments and the major surgery and all the associated side effects and complications that could come from that. And so, you know, I think over time it has been evolving, and, um, and now we're in an area that is very exciting in terms of oncology and cancer care. And how do we take it that, integrate that, and adapt to it, to provide, you know, the, the, the care, the, the, the gold standard care for all our patients. Right. You know, it was about 1991 with, that we had the worst um, um, degree of success, the, the worst outcomes in terms of the number of people with cancer dying of cancer. Since 1991, we've had a 38% reduction in cancer deaths related to significant improvements in Er, in screening, early detection, and significant improvement in uh, treatments. Um, you, you talk about, you know, back in the, the day 100 years ago, the only truly effective way of getting rid of cancer was to take it out. And so, as you, you mentioned, it was like, how much of the body can we take out to have the best chance of getting rid of the cancer? But um, the reason that it ended up not being more successful to just take out more and more of the body is some cancer spread to other parts of the body. And even as you take out the primary, if it had already spread, you weren't going to be successful in curing the patient. So now we have ways of taking care of those cancer cells that might have already spread away from the primary tumor. And undoubtedly, all of our medical oncology and radiation oncology along with surgery has led to significant improvements in cure of cancer. Yeah, I think it goes back to the, the the statement that, you know, I think we are stronger together. Yes. And so I love, you know, of, of what we do every day is that we get to collaborate and work as a team to to deliver, you know, the, the, the care that we get to deliver to our patients. One of the things that just um, amazes and inspires me about surgical oncologists. So I'm a radiation oncologist. You know, if I'm going to design a radiation treatment, I can do it on my computer. I can take my time. I can draw this and draw that and figure out which angles are the best. If I'm a medical oncologist, I figure out which chemotherapy I'm going to use. And I look up what's the dose. And I just write in order to say, give this patient this medication and this dose. You, on the other hand, I mean, you are working with your hands in a patient to technically, um, carefully dissect, remove, reconnect uh, in real time. You're not sitting at home on your computer doing this. Uh, real time, real tactile skills uh, and composure as you're doing this surgery looking for any bleeding. So what was it like to develop that talent to be able to work inside of a human being with lots of people watching you as you're resecting a tumor and reconstructing the anatomy? 
Yeah, I guess I would say that you know these day and age is a little bit very uh, is a little bit different, uh, <laughs> and I would imagine you know um, uh, one day we might be able to you know go to a, a tablet somewhere, tap in what we want done, and the robot would do it all for us. <laughs> We're not there yet. We're not quite We're there not yet. There. <laughs> you are still using some skills, right? Um, yes. So. Um, you know, I think it, it, it come with, uh, and I would say it, it come with uh, many sleepless nights, uh, or nights of uh, intense training, and uh, and and that's one of the draw that um, that for me to be at Mercy One is the fact that I get to participate in our general uh, uh, in our graduate medical education, and in our general surgery uh, residency training. Um, and, and because it brings me back to all, you know, uh, my own experience and then my own memories of going through that training process and, know, and, and, and sort of uh, have an idea of what it really takes to develop those skill sets. Um, and, and so without going in, you know, obviously the nuances in the Pacific of that, um, but, but, you know, it takes repetitions, you know, thousands of cases to gain that, that set of skills to be able to get to do things like that. And, and in my opinion, that's very justified uh, of the amount of, you know, commitment and, 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 uh, and dedication that ones need to be able to do because we need uh, capable and competency of, you know, of, of, of our, uh, um, of what, you know, our surgeons able to deliver out to the public. Yeah. To provide, you know, make sure patients get the best of care. So, I mean, I kind of think of it like a, like a concert violinist that can be up there on stage with people watching, and doing this amazing, you know, technique, this physical technique that comes from um, experience and just sort of flows in the midst of people watching you. Um, and not only do you have to worry about a string breaking, or but to, but you have to just let go and let your body do what it can do is, is surgery like that when you're in, oh. in the midst of a five hour surgery and uh, you're methodically going through take me may, take me through um what does it feel like to do a whipple so a whipple um you probably know who dr whipple was but i imagine he was a surgeon who put his name to this surgery that is kind of the quintessential surgery that is done to try to cure pancreas cancer and it can take a long time so what is it like from beginning to end of doing a complicated surgery like that to remove part of the pancreas and reconnect everything yeah i think you know for um uh, and then when you getting into um uh, obviously uh, anytime you get into any kind of a complex or complicated um case or um or or things that you want to do um the best always do you know to fall back on the fundamental and the basic and you know what you really describes is the fundamental right the basics of how do you orchestrate your movement and how do you uh, uh carry out those fine hand-eye coordination movement and techniques um and those are the basics that you know you, you need to possess and then you know and then obviously the the steps and so you have to be able to know those steps, you know, and then, you know, you go from one steps to another and to another. Obviously, our experience and, 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 and is how we able to navigate those steps in such a, uh, um, a way would could also make a difference as well. Um, and, and so, like you said, with that, 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 that violinist, right, she, uh, she or he um, has, you know, obviously the, uh, the, the book in front of her and each note you know, would be a movement. And so how do you follow those notes with the movement and the time and the hand and the eyes coordination in those movement? It's like dancing to me, you know, I, I that's how, you know, one of my mentor uh, really um, have taught me was that, you know, surgery is like a dance. You in there and you'd want to coordinate and choreographic your movement in such a way that you accomplish what you want to get accomplished in a fairly effortlessly uh, uh, um, uh, 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 sequence of movement that to get you know to 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 the end 
that. So for a whip operation, what can take anywhere from five to eight hours, you know, and there are, you know, I have witnessed my uh, uh, very senior and, and uh, mentor of mine who have done that in, you know, three and a half, four hours. But obviously that take years and years of repetition, hand-eye coordination, muscle memory uh, to, to fine tune it, to get to that, that point. And it's just following steps and then obviously possess the hand and eye fine technical movement skill in order to do so. But as I was alluded to earlier, though, is that, you know, there has been somewhat of a revolution currently right now in terms of surgery and the tools that we have in terms of being able to put to do those surgery and and obviously robotic surgery is a huge, you know, yeah. it's a huge um, um, a phenomenon. Yeah, in, let's talk about that. Right so, now. so, um, so I assume that robotic surgery means that you send R two T D two in to the <laughs> operating room. You're sitting in the lounge, just kind of watching on TV as R two D two or CP three O. I don't know who's the better <laughs> surgeon to sort of do the the work. Is that is that what it is? Uh, uh, I wish that is the case, but it's not. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> we are not quite there yet. <laughs> so, what is robotic surgery? Yes, robotic surgery, uh, in a nutshell, is using a robot platform under the supervision and control of the surgeons to do the task of whatever that task may be. Um, um, and so the robot in itself has multiple arms and, and the ability to switch instruments in each of those arms allow us to carry out very, you know, very involved and very complex maneuvers uh, within a cavity or, or within a cavity. Um, and, 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 and I think that that would probably be a, a good description of that. Yeah. So you're actually working the robot. So instead of you using a scissors with your fingers, cut, 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 you are have the robot arm down there with the little tiny scissors and you can just advance millimeter, millimeter, millimeter. So it takes out the, the, the human more gross, large movements and allows this robot to very accurately and precisely uh, do the types of cutting, sewing, dissecting. I don't um, know. Is that kind of what it is? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Um, and, 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 and there are, you know, obviously with everything, there are um, advantages and then there are disadvantages uh -huh. of, of, of uh, whichever tools that we have at our disposal to, to use. Um, obviously, you know, the, 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 some of the benefit that has been highlighted with the robotic platform has been, um, as you mentioned, the, the improved visualization with the camera on the robot, you can see things much better. Uh, 3D visualization, sometimes even magnify. So we get to see better uh, than, than at the human eyes. <laughs> Uh, the, obviously, the 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 steady of the uh, the robotic instruments, um, and also the, the but at, at, on the same token, it allows you to have a much more a three hundred and sixty degree of articulations and 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 and, and of movement of that that instruments that is better than what the human hand, um, I would say allow you to do in terms of the ergonomic. But on the flip side of that, though, what was not cannot be replicate is that touch sensations. And as you know, the touch sensation is, is highly critical uh, when it comes to touching the human tissue and, and sort of um, knowing how much you can grasp and how much you cannot grasp, mm -hmm. especially when it's starting to get, you know, into a critical part of the operations. And so, and that's why there is a learning curve to it. You know, in order to use that, you have to have, uh, uh, there is a learning curve in allowing you to replace some of the, the deficiency in the robotic platform with other tips and techniques that you can use to compensate for some of that. So in general, so, um, when you do uh, surgery with robotic tools, um, you often don't have to make as big of an incision 
as with a regular open surgery. So oftentimes healing and recovery can be faster. Um, yes. So, you know, with, um, and so thank you for bringing that up is the fact that, you know, robotic surgery is one form of minimally invasive surgery. And obviously I think our audience are familiar with that concept. Meaning well, they, that, they may not be. The term minimally invasive surgery, yeah. what does that mean? So historically, we always associate with surgery get involved making an open incisions to get to the target of what you want to do, uh, whether you fix it, remove it, repair it, et cetera. Yeah. So for the abdomen, but, just big incision down the middle or chest, a big incision all the way around the chest would be, and then the surgeon gets his or her hands in there. Right. But with a minimally invasive um, it's not like it's not invasive, but you smaller incisions and using the robotic tools instead of your two big hands. So in, in the, the 80s, uh, late 80s, transitioning into the early 90s, you know, we have very talented and uh, um, surgeons and engineer who came up with the concept of uh, what for cavitary surgery, meaning that you do surgery in a cavity, whether it's in the chest or in the belly or in the pelvis, um, instead of making a big open cut and exposing that part of the body, why don't we just make a little incisions about five to 10, um, five to 10 millimeter in size, and then put in access port. And then through those port, we have access to that cavity, then we would inflate the, 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 that, that cavity either with a small amount of uh, CO2 to, to increase the working space, and then we would put instruments through those port gotcha. and, so and perform surgery that way. It's like the skin of the abdomen becomes the tent that you're working inside. Correct inside a tent and you know that's and, and and so that is something we call laparoscopic surgery thoroscopic surgery and then our orthopedic uh, uh orthopedic surgeons incorporate that into their their, their joints type of surgery the arthroscopic arthroscopic yeah. um and so following the same line of uh technological evolution uh in the early 2000s um you know, there's a big company and, you know, for the purpose of our discussions, we're not going to use name or because, you know, this is. A, you can say Da Vinci. Okay. All okay. right. <laughs> and, and, and I want to, you know, let you guys know I have no disclosure in any of this. Okay. I, I have no vested interest in, in any of this. He was a great painter. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, they, they, uh, they uh, had the bright idea of instead of, um, uh, having tools that surgeons would use their hands to manipulate and grasp and control, uh, why don't we create a robot that has 360 degree of articulation at the end of its wrist? Mm -hmm. Just like your hands could turn all the way. Correct. Yes. And then we can dock the robot to those ports, and we would use the instruments on those robots and control it at a console that is away from the patients, excuse me. Um, and so that's when robotic surgery started to become, you know, and uh, recognize tools and, 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 and ways to perform surgery. And obviously we, we're not gonna go into, you know, obviously the data and, 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 and the, the support behind why it is acceptable form of, you know, surgery that we can do today. But the studies show that uh, we get at least as good a results in terms of curing of cancer, uh, probably faster healing. Yeah. But the procedure may take longer than Correct. the open procedure. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think um, you have to judge something for what it is. And you cannot judge it more than what it really is. So, um, and I think that has been a little bit of a um, confusion in terms of even in the medical uh, or in the, the, the scientific journal, uh, literature is that sometimes people tend to you know, get carried away and start analyzing something that is beyond the scope of what it really is. And so, um, you know, at the, uh, the robot, the, 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 the robotic platform for surgery is really is a tool that at our disposal to use in terms of providing surgery and, and, and uh, for the patients. Now, 
as you mentioned, the perioperative outcomes associated with that methods has been shown to have less morbidity associated from the surgery. So fewer side effects. Fewer side effects uh, compared to even laparoscopic surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, and equivalent or equal in terms of oncologic treatment outcomes. Yeah. So we can, you know, do essentially the same type of surgery, uh, laparoscopic or robotic, uh, remove the, 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 you know, the cancer in whatever organ that may be, um, and have similar oncologic outcome, meaning that the margin status is you know, the same, the number of lymph nodes we're able to harvest it from the body is, is the same. Um, so if you have two treatments that equivalent in terms of the treatment effect, but less side effects, then obviously you would look yeah. at it as being a little bit superior compared to the other one. Now, obviously, it's all, you also have to take into account of the judgment and 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 the the, the level of comfort and someone experience in performing those type of 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 um, uh, who do those methods. But uh, but in the nutshell, that's what it really uh, has been. Now, in term of the long term outcomes that we always judge everything based off is you know so if you can do the same operations uh and less morbid does that mean patient live longer and we don't have the data for that right now because the 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 at least the robotic platform is fairly new and and i and also i think it's a little bit unfair to judge it that way because as we know you know patient long-term outcome fall back on to the multi-modality treatments that we're able to give in addition to the disease process that they had coming into it and 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 the biology of that cancer that mm -hmm. that that may be but right now I, we think it's fair to say correct me if you disagree that that doing the surgery open versus robotic uh we think that you get the same results in terms of the outcome of curing the cancer but that you have faster healing and fewer complications by doing it robotically, but it takes a little bit longer under Correct. anesthesia. Yeah. Correct. So we've talked a lot about technique, so I'm gonna uh, switch gears a little bit. So um, I firmly believe that um, uh, being a doctor is a human being taking care of another human being. And we've talked about all of the technical expertise that you do with the patient under anesthesia who isn't really witnessing or, or, or talking to you at the time. But now you've just finished an eight hour surgery to remove a pancreas cancer and you need to now go into the uh, recovery room and then go into the consultation room to talk to the family who has been waiting in the surgery waiting, waiting room for eight hours while their loved one is under anesthesia and you're doing your surgery. So a very different skill set to go into that room and talk to the family than the skill set you exhibited in the operating room. Tell me a bit about how you have learned um, to, uh, to develop that skill set. Yeah, I think, um, and that's um, the one of a very humble aspect of surgical oncology is being able to um, possess, you know, multiple different skill sets to not only provide the treatments for patients, but also uh, process those informations and in return, delivering and translating that, that information back to the patients or their family. Um, well, you know, I think after an eight hour operations and obviously depends on the technical aspect of it, um, I would go get a, some water first, you know, maybe as a, a restroom break, <laughs> Good. Uh, you know, and kind of recollect myself a little bit. Uh, and then I would meet the patient's uh, family in, in, in one of the consultation rooms. And, you know, my approach is always with patients and, and families, you know, I think I fall back on, on really the three uh, characteristic. One is you have to be clear. Uh, two, you have to be organized. And then three, you have to be upfront. 
and 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 being able to deliver those information obviously in a very em em emphatic uh, fashions uh, would help too. But, uh, but you know, I would kind of, and sometimes I, I, I err on the side of providing more information than less. Uh, and to a fault that sometimes I get a little bit more technical than I feel like I need. But, uh, but at the end of the day, I, if I feel like I can deliver all the information to them, uh, then, you know, I, 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 I have nothing else to really worry about. Um, in the process of um, becoming a member of the team, you almost always meet the patient in your probably your clinic for the first visit and uh, get to know them as a person in the family and talk about risks, risks and benefits of, of surgery. And then you do the surgery and um, oftentimes they're in the hospital for a few days before they're able to go home. Um, how is that, does it work, that relationship? How, how do you invest in the relationship prior to the surgery with the patient? And how does uh, caring for them after the surgery, um, what can you say about that relationship that you develop with the patients? And then in follow-up, when um, sometimes it takes a few days before you get all the results of the pathology back. Yeah, I think... Um... For me, um, I think it's important that I, you know, I, I, we, I always try to be as clear as possible with the goal, the objective, and obviously the intent of what we try to do in that operation for, for patients. And, and the way I categorize, you know, all operations uh, um, would be that are we there to get tissue for diagnosis? Uh, are we there to finish station, you know, the, the cancers when we have a diagnosis for them? Uh, or are we there to provide treatment in terms of either curing them of, you know, the, whatever the cancer it may be? Um, or are we there to debulk or remove in the majority of that, that, that those tumors and cancers? Uh, or the treatment would be just palliations, meaning that we're there to improve the quality of life in some shapes or form. Uh, or we are there to, you know, putting things in to provide support for them as they undergo another type of treatments, mm -hmm. or are we there to restore, you know, their, their bodily function uh, for, for what it is. And so once you are clear and, 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 and uh, with patients and help them understand what those intent would be, then in some way, I feel like patients are more, very appreciative when they understand um, and, and then obviously we can go into the, the conversation of risk and benefit and all the potential things that may arise. Uh, but in that conversation alone, that's how we develop that relationships. Um, you know, and how do you deliver that news and, you know, the social circumstance that's involved in that uh, are unique in every, each of those instances. But in my opinion, that's how I develop relationship patients. Um, and, and as I say, you know, sometimes I do feel like I'm so matter of fact to a fault. But at the same time, you know, I feel like I have done my job when I'm able to do that with patients. And so as we finish the operations and patients stay in the hospital for a few days, um, we can follow on up on that. Um, and, and, but I will always tell patients that, you know, the first few days and even the most of their hospital stay, we have a different, you know, agenda to accomplish. We're not there really for what those intentions of, uh, that we are set for surgery, but we are there to try to get them through their surgery and, and, and recovered and try to get them recover. And then most of the time when we deliver the news of whatever that, that we have, try to do initially the, the original intent of the surgery is when they come back and see us in the clinic. So you get to see all the faces of that care. And I think to me, that's, that's a very humbling uh, uh, process to be a part of. You know, we have a, uh, about 10 minutes left, so we're going to do questions and answers here. So uh, in front of you is your own surgical oncologist, your opportunity to ask a uh, surgical oncologist anything you want about cancer care. If you have a surgery coming up uh, and you know there's a technique that you haven't practiced in a while, I, mean, I imagine you rehearse that. Is, is there uh, a virtual reality tools you can sit down and actually do a rehearsal? 
of what are the moves you have to do or, or, or you just do it in your head? How, how do you do What's your approach? Um, you know, I think uh, that's a great question um, and that's a great point. Um, that would fall back into, you know, surgical educations. Uh, there are tools in terms of simulations uh, that allow um, our trainees and obviously some, you know, surgeons who are in practice to go back and, and, and rehearse those movements uh, in order to do so. Um, so for me personally, uh, I like to just uh, stay um, um, calm and, and, and recollect those, those, those memory. Um, and, 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 and for the most part, um, uh, I think uh, as with everything that's complicated and as everything that's involved and complex, I always go back to the fundamentals. And I always go back to the basics, and and I don't know if that quite makes sense or really explain that. The, okay, the, yeah, those be, questions. Be honest. Mm -hmm. Do you watch a YouTube video the night before? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm being serious. You because, know, because um, you know, once a year I tie a bow tie for a black tie event, and I just bring up the YouTube video because I, I know how to do it. But, but and I bet there are YouTube videos of somebody doing a Whipple. Oh, uh, yes. So there are a lot of YouTube videos. And actually, some institutions create a whole library of, mm -hmm. of, of videos uh, on surgery. Um, um, for me, I would say I watch YouTube videos probably 1% of the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I felt like if it's an operation that I'm not familiar with, then, you know, I need someone there that know how to do the operation mm -hmm. with me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would not jeopardize any kind of safety aspect for patients by saying that you watch the YouTube video and you're able to go and do the, the, yeah. the surgery. I mean, yeah. that's, that I, shouldn't I'm, happen. I'm just pulling your leg a right. little bit. Now, but. Now, <laughs> now, my references that I go back to are, you know, I uh, we have... Um, uh, books and and journals that describes and 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 show these steps and you know obviously a lot of you know I would say almost all of my operation I have seen done and you know uh, in the past and so it's just going back to those those that book uh, and 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 refresh my memory on it and then try to you know stay uh, uh, especially the night before I always try to you know re recollect as far as um, the steps involved and what my experience has been uh, going through it and we work as a team too uh, for for all of us you know I have uh, partners and and senior partners who I you know always fall back on in terms of you know being there with me and 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 vice versa you know and there where that when there's a big and tough cases, my partners would also get me into it because we give each other feedback and perspective that we may not be uh, fully uh, acknowledged of at that moment. And, uh, and so I would say that, you know, um, teamwork, collaboration, and uh, our, our critical aspect of, of being able to deliver, um, you know, quality and safe care for patients. And YouTube videos. Yeah. <laughs> Poon, you actually, have a question? Actually, we have made videos. You've made videos. You we show have made videos, videos yes. to Cancer yes. Conference. Yes, yeah. we have made our own videos of, yeah. you know, operation that we've done to share with publics as okay. well. We had so, a couple, couple more questions here I want to get to. I don't want to cut you off, but... Of course. Doctor, what type of surgery you use currently with the robotics? Yes, uh, we... Robots. Yeah, so what types of uh, surgeries do you do in surgical oncology where you use the robot? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for the questions. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, the conversation of robotic surgery haven't bored you uh, yet. Um, I think for me, it takes a little bit of creativity. Uh, so short answer to your questions would be, you know, um, esophagus surgery. Uh, in the last few years, we have evolved as a practice in a group to incorporate robotic surgery into our uh, esophagectomy. Um, and then um, upper uh, GI or uh, the upper gastrointestinal tract type of surgery, uh, esophagus, uh, stomach, um, some liver, some pancreas. And then anything that I, uh, when I review a case, and I feel that I can use the robot for, uh, on, uh, and 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 the feasibility and being able to get it done, 
uh, would be something that I, I always try to incorporate it into my practice. I think you might have been the first surgeon to do a robotic esophagectomy in the state. In, uh, in as my understanding is in central Iowa. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But, so it's uh, removing the esophagus without opening the patient up. But as you know, that does take, you know, a lot of preparations, a lot of, um, uh, and, 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 and to answer, go back to the last question, I did not watch YouTube video for that one. <laughs> uh, in my preparation for that one. So it's not only uh, removing the esophagus, but it's reconnecting it. Yes. Yes. Um, but you know that's that's just take uh, preparation and experience and being uh, a part of the the group and the practice and 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 I can t I can't tell you all the amazing talents and, and really smart uh, uh, doctors and individuals that we have in our program that allow us you know to build and get to that point. Yeah, teamwork, yeah. and it's it really not only the the doctors but the operating room nurses yes. and technicians and yes. you know. Huge. We have time for one more question. I have a question about the robotics. You know, yet I know you have a camera on there. It's just one camera on the end. Is there? Have you read that there's possibility of additional type of things that they might be putting on those robotics? You know, like, for instance, uh, temperature gauges or somehow uh, touch and feel or something like that. Uh, do you think that is something that might come in the future? Well, anything is a possibility. You know, I think that's how we should look at, 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 at you know, everything in general. Uh, the the camera that's currently on the the robotic platforms uh, allow us not only to see uh, light, uh, but also a little bit of alter visualizations. So there's a you know quote unquote or depend how you look at but a black light mode. So if there's a black light mode, then you can you know inject patients with different medications, and we be able to see things moving in real life uh, that we nor not normally see. Uh, in terms of whether we can, you know, do like a thermal uh, um, uh, night visions or thermal, you know, some kind of, uh, um, um, I'm sure there's they in the work for it. I, I don't know. Thermal visions. visions so yeah. You can, yeah. yeah. I, what about um, like injecting? Um, so I'm thinking of like uh, photodynamic therapy where you inject something that goes to the cancer and it's kind of lights it up. Uh, <laughs> is that? something, you know, I know for like sentinel nodes, you track the nodes, you can inject a dye, a blue dye that sort of shows you where the lymph nodes are that you want to remove that might have the cancer. So we uh, actually made a video <laughs> of that specific instances. So we had a patient with, um, who had colon cancer and uh, she was treated for the colon cancer, but, um, about two years afterward, she developed a recurrence in the liver. And it was an isolated uh, area in the liver. And, uh, but as you know, the, the liver is a three-dimensional organ. And so the tumor happened to be in sort of deep to the liver. So it's not something that we typically would see right away when we get inside the patients. So then uh, there's been a lot of description in the literature about, you know, the use of uh, endocyanide green or ICG, which is one of the dye that we can use and inject into patients. And when you inject that dye into the patients, we can actually see the tumor glow up. And so we would turn the visions on the camera into a firefly mode uh, and, and we can see it right in there in the center. Mm -hmm. And so we did that and we removed that tumor uh, in a very minimally invasive way and, uh, and got it taken care of. And patients spend, I believe she spent one day in the hospital Wow! and she left the next day. Wow. Amazing. So it was, uh, and we made a video of that, by the way, yeah. <laughs> that, that I would love to Netflix? share. <laughs> so you keep making the videos, uh, but it is, it, it, uh, it's always great when, um, uh, Dr. Lay brings a video to the multidisciplinary cancer conference and you can actually see uh, the, the, the resection uh, taking place. So I want to thank you, Viet. Thank you so much for my being pleasure. my guest.
to this evening and thank all of you for uh, attending. If you know someone that would benefit or enjoy watching this video uh, beginning tomorrow, it will be available on demand at the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel or at the Mercy One Cancer Center website. So please uh, share that information with others and I hope you will join us again next week. Thanks for coming.